how your mind will be secure. Today I'm going to discuss about our paper on perfect correctness in lockable obfuscation. This is a joint work with Rishabh Goyal, Venkata Coppola, and Brent Waters. As you all know, IO has proven to be the most powerful primitive in entire cryptography. It has tons of applications and you can do pretty much anything in cryptography given IO. But unfortunately, we don't know how to construct IO given standard assumptions. Probably we can look for some slightly weaker primitives that has many applications and can still be constructed from standard assumptions. To that end, Goel, Coppola and Waters and Wixen uh, Zidelis proposed this beautiful notion called lockable obfuscation. Obfuscation. Here there are two algorithms, obfuscator and evaluator. The obfuscator obfuscates a program P and the evaluator evaluates the obfuscated program on any input. But unlike the regular obfuscation, uh, here the obfuscator also takes a message and a random string called the lock value alpha also as input. The correctness criteria says that when you want to evaluate the obfuscated program on any input x, if p of x is equal to alpha, then the obfuscated program reveals the message. And if p of x is not alpha, then the obfuscated program is supposed to output perf. For the security part, given a program and a message, if you obfuscate the program using a random lock value, then the obfuscated program should be indistinguishable from a simulator, simulated program. That essentially means the obfuscated program should hide the message and the program itself. The two papers that propose this notion, they also gave a construction based on learning with errors assumption. So we know how to construct lockable obfuscation from standard assumptions. And at the same time, they also have shown plenty of applications of lockable obfuscation. So that's pretty nice as well. But as it turns out, the construction of the two papers doesn't satisfy the correctness criteria perfectly. If P of X is equal to alpha, then the obfuscated program will always reveal the message. And in that side, it's a perfectly correct mechanism. But if P of X is not alpha, then with some negligible probability, the obfuscated program doesn't output perp. Here, the probability is taken over the random coins used in the obfuscator. Well, this scenario occurs in many other crypto papers. We know so many schemes in cryptography which are only statistically correct, and we are satisfied with them. And now we can ask, what's the big deal if lockable obfuscation is only statistically correct? And now let's see some applications where perfect correctness is actually required. Suppose the government wants to have an intrusion detection software. Basically what the software does is, given the profile of a person, the software outputs one if he is an intruder. And the government outputs the job to some other private company. In an ideal scenario, the company uh, generates a program P honestly and obfuscates a program using lockable obfuscation and gives the obfuscated program P prime to the government. But what if the company is malicious and then it can choose some bad randomness during the obfuscation. And to be even more specific, the company can first choose some innocent person X. So the original program uh, doesn't raise a flag on this innocent person. And, but the uh, company chooses some bad randomness R such that the obfuscated program is incorrect and the obfuscated program doesn't output perp and the obfuscated program raises the flag on this innocent person. And that's a serious issue because the government would then frame an innocent person. In future, even if the government gets a doubt and on the company and wants to audit the process, the government can ask the company to show it that it did, did its job correctly. In that case, the company can just send the original program P and the random SR used during obfuscation. The government would then just accept the audit process because the, there is no way where uh, the government could check whether the random SR is bad or not. And this problem can be solved if we use the perfectly correct uh, lockable obfuscation mechanism. And even more generally speaking, uh, let me give some cryptographic applications where uh, perfect correctness of lockable obfuscation may be necessary. Generally speaking, if the lockable obfuscation is used by a trusted party, let's say the obfuscation program is generated by the setup algorithm and is included in the public parameters, then even a statistically correct, correct lockable obfuscation might be okay. But if the lockable obfuscation is used by an untrusted party, let's say the obfuscated program is part of a ciphertext, anyone can generate a ciphertext, then perfect, perfect correctness might actually be required. And let's say the obfuscated program is generated by a prover in an ISIC proof. Since the prover could be correct, even in that case, perfect correctness might be required. And uh, to give more concrete examples, 
Bitansky and Schmierly constructed constant term post quantum secure zero knowledge arguments. In this case, the lockup refuscation, if it is not perfectly correct, then the commitment scheme uh, that they were using uh, is going to be not, is not perfectly binding. And that actually violates their uh, security properties. And their proof even assumes that the perfect correctness of lockup refuscation for some hybrid arguments. Our work really helps to make this construction go through. And similarly, uh, Anantan Laplaka constructed quantum extraction protocol recently. They use lockup obfuscation to construct circular insecure quantum effigy. Here, an obfuscated program is given as part of the public parameters. And the obfuscated program is designed in such a way that, in case an adversary gets hold of some circularly encrypted subtext, that is, encryption of secret key 2 with public key pk1 and encryption of secret key 1 with public key pk2. Given uh, if the adversary get hold of the circularly secure ciphertext, then the lockup obfuscation is used so that it can reveal, uh, it can break the circular security. It can break the security property. And even here, uh, one-sided perfect correctness is still required. And similarly, Bitansky and others constructed zero knowledge arguments. Here, the obfuscated program is part of a trapdoor. Since trapdoor is usually generated by a trusted party, one-sided perfect correctness is actually sufficient here. Actually, the previous constructions already satisfy this one-sided perfect correctness property, but still, this enforces the point where perfect correctness might be required for some applications. And now, uh, coming to the results of the paper, we constructed perfectly correct lockable obfuscation by modifying the previous construction from lattices. And in order to do this, we also had to construct injective piages from lattices. So we are gave two constructions of injective piages as a side result. The first one is from learning with rounding assumption, and the second one is from learning parity with noise assumption. Before discussing our construction, let's see how the previous construction works. They do it in three steps. They first construct lockup obfuscation just for NC1 circuits and for one-bit messages. And then uh, they bootstrap this construction to polyester circuits and still one-bit messages. And then they extend this construction further for polyester circuits and multi-bit messages. As it turns out, steps two and three, they preserve perfect correctness property. If step one gives a perfectly correct lockup obfuscation, then the final lockup obfuscation is going to be perfectly correct. And in the previous work, the lockup obfuscation that is output by the step one is actually not perfectly correct. We'll look into the previous construction, we'll see why it's not perfectly correct and what changes we can make to make it perfectly correct. And from now, from now on, we'll just concentrate on NC1 circuits only in one bit messages. The previous papers actually make a small change for the security proof to go through. Instead of obfuscating the program P, they instead obfuscate the program P prime, which is obtained by first computing the function P and then uh, computing a length expanding pseudo random generator on P's output. We of course need to make sure that the PRG is also in NC1 so that P prime is in NC1. And they can start their scheme actually satisfy uh, a slightly different correctness criteria uh, than the previous one. Suppose beta equals to PRG of alpha, then uh, the correctness criteria that they, this obfuscation mechanism satisfies is if P prime of X is matches beta, then the obfuscated program outputs message. And if P prime of X is not, set, is not equal to beta, then the obfuscated program outputs perp. Generally in crypto, whenever uh, we are dealing with NC1 circuits, it's very difficult to first convert them into branching programs via Barrington's theorem. This is an example of a Barrington's uh, branching program. This is, this is just a graph of nodes arranged in the form of layers. In each layer, there are three nodes, so the width is three, and there are five layers, so the length is five. And each node has two edges, a red edge and a green edge. The red edge corresponds to bit zero, and the green edge corresponds to bit one. In the first layer, there is a special node marked in gray called the start node. And in the final layer, there are two special nodes. The green one corresponds to uh, accepting state and the red node corresponds to rejecting state. When you want to evaluate the branching program, you first start with the start node. You process one bit of input at a time. If the bit is zero, follow the red edge. If the bit is green, so if the bit is one, follow the green edge. You keep doing this until the end, until uh, you end up in either the green state or the red state. If you end up in the green state, output one. If you end up in the red state, output zero. The state transitions that corresponds to bit zero are represented in the red matrices and the state transitions that represent the green edges, the corresponding to the bit one are represented in 
the green matrices. And remember our program P prime uh, outputs multiple bits. Since a branching program can only output a single bit, we first need to split our program P prime into L components. The ith program computes the ith output bit of the program P. We now represent each of these individual programs into a branching program. And now our goal is to obfuscate each of these L branching programs. To obfuscate each program, we'll first find an alternate representation for representing each state of the branching program, representing alternate representation for each node. And then we also find an alternate representation for the state transition functions pi. And now let's see how to do that. To obfuscate the ith branching program, we first associate each of the nodes to some matrix M. For all the layers other than the last layer, these matrices are just chosen uniformly at random, along with some lattice numbers, but we forget about that. Uh, in the last layer, in the last layer matrices, we encode the lock value and the message. So here's how it goes. So here's how we encode the last layer. Let's consider all the matrices of all the last final layer matrices of all the final branching programs. If the ith bit of beta is one, then circle the green matrix in the ith branching program. If the ith bit of beta is zero, then circle the red matrix in the ith branching program. And then uh, we'll sample all the non-circle matrices uniformly at random. And then we'll circle uh, sample all the circle matrices still uniformly at random, but subject to one condition. The condition is this. The sum of the circle matrices encodes the message. The sum of the circle matrices is going to be zero matrix if message is zero, and the sum of the circle matrices is going to be square root q times identity matrix if the message is one. Here q is our modulus. So this is how uh, the message is actually encoded in the final layer matrices. And now we find alternate representation for the state transition functions pi. Here uh, c10 is an alternate representation for pi10 and c11 is an alternate representation for pi11. These representations are chosen in such a way that LW problem can be encoded into these matrices. The obfuscated program, the final obfuscated program is going to contain the M matrix corresponding to the start node, M11, and it also consists of all these state transition matrices, C10, C11, and so on. And we do the, and we include this for all the L branching programs, and that's going to be a final obfuscated program. Now let's see how to evaluate this alpha scalar program. We initially stored the matrix M11 and then corresponding to the start node. If the first bit of the input is zero, the multiply with C10. If the first bit of uh, input is one, then multiply with C11. You keep multiplying these C matrices depending upon the bits of the input. And what you get is an expression like this. And by the way we designed our C matrices, we obtain an expression of this kind. Here, M output corresponds to the output matrix. Uh, so if the output of the branching program is one, M output is going to be this green matrix. If the output of the branching program is zero, then the M output is going to be this red matrix. And uh, here we all S and error are matrices with small entries, for example, from some large distribution. And so if M output has small entries, then uh, this overall output is also going to have so only small entries because S and error are small. And similarly, if M output is going to have large entries, then the overall output is also going to have large entries. Until now, we just evaluated one branching program, right? But our obfuscated program contains many branching programs. And now let's see how to evaluate the overall obfuscated program. To obfuscate, uh, to, to obtain the overall output for the entire obfuscated program, we just sum up these output matrices. And when you factor out the S and error terms, you get an expression of this kind. So it essentially means S times summation of the output M matrices and plus error. Remember we encoded the message in the output layer with this condition. That means if the program's output is beta, then the summation of output is going to be uh, either zero if message is zero in such a case, if the summation M output is zero, then this overall uh, summation is going to have only small entries. So that's how you can distinguish whether the message is zero or not. And if this uh, program's output is beta, in that case, 
this summation is going to be square root q times identity and this overall summation is going to only contain medium entries and that's how you can distinguish whether uh, message is one or not and suppose if the program's output is not equals to beta and then at least one of the entries in this summation is going to be a non circle matrix is the the matrix that doesn't correspond to the beta in such a case that matrix is entirely uniformly sampled without any conditions so in that case this overall summation is going to be some uniformly random matrix and so this overall summation uh, s times summation output plus error it's going to contain it's going to be uniformly random and it's going to contain large entries with high probability so that's how you can uh, distinguish whether message is zero message is one or whether p of p prime of x is not equal to beta so if so to evaluate the first iterative program you can just sum up these output matrices and of each branching program and then compare the size of the entries and that's all about the prior construction that we already know and now let's see let's discuss why the above construction is not perfectly correct there are two issues the first issue is that there is a mismatch between the correctness criteria that is actually required and the correctness criteria that is satisfied by the above construction we we, we need that we needed that the original program satisfy this correctness criteria if pfx is equals to alpha we want the obfuscated program to output the message if pfx is not equals to alpha we want the obfuscated program to output bot but the above construction satisfies this correctness criteria instead the above uh, construction obfuscates the program p prime which is prg of uh, function p and if beta equals to prg of alpha the above uh, the the correctness criteria satisfied by the previous construction is that if p prime of x is equals to beta then the obfuscated program outputs a message if p prime of x is not equal to beta then the obfuscated program just outputs bot this mismatch in the correctness criteria actually creates a problem this is uh, there are times when the second correctness criteria is satisfied but the first criteria correctness criteria is not satisfied this could happen when prg that we are using is not injected in such a case when suppose pfx is equals to gamma and uh, prg of gamma matches with beta then the above construction reveals the message but ideally we are required to output perf because gamma is not equals to alpha and the second issue is that consider the case where p prime of x is not equal to beta in that case whenever you evaluate the branching programs the sum of these output matrices is going to be random uniformly at random and using this observation we check that p prime of x is not equal to beta by checking if this summation is going to have large entries you know a uniformly random matrix will have large entries with overwhelming probability but there is some negligible probability that the summation is going to have small entries in such a case our evaluation algorithm outputs 0 or 1 instead of outputting both so these are the two reasons why the above obfuscation mechanism is not perfectly correct and now let's solve both issues one by one the first issue is that there is a mismatch between the required correctness property and what is given with the prior construction and this can be solved if we can use injective prgs in the construction if you use injective prgs then beta has only a single inverse for the prg function and our problem is solved but the prior construction of prg from lattices they were not injected we solve this issue by giving two constructions of injective prgs the first one is from learning with rounding assumption and the second one is from learning parity with noise assumption let me describe the construction from learning with rounding assumption here the public parameters are sampled uniformly at random from uh, domain zq and for computing prg and input s we just multiply s with the matrix a and we scale down the modulus from modulus q to modulus p learning with rounding assumption states that if s is sampled uniformly at random then the prg output should also be pseudo random but unfortunately this construction is not injective and due to the scaling down operation the prg could map the prg function could map two different inputs to the same output and now to make the prg injective instead of sampling a from a uniform distribution we sample a from some kind of error correcting goal which means that when you consider the values of s1 times a and s2 times a for for any s1 and s2 
they're far from each other. So that even when you scale on a modulus, they don't collide. And here's how we sample uh, the matrix A. We first sample some uniformly random matrix from domain ZQ. And then we sample uh, uniformly random matrix R from domain plus, plus one and minus one. And then we set D to be a matrix with large entries. Here rho is a large value and IN is a identity matrix. And then we set A to be concatenation of the matrix B and B times R plus D. And uh, by left of hash lemma, you can actually prove that the matrix A is, the, the distribution of matrix A is statistically close to uniform. And now let's see if uh, this matrix A actually forms an error correcting code and if we can prove this construction to be injected. Basically what we want to prove is, given any two inputs S1 and S2, we want to prove that their PRG outputs don't collide with each other. So basically what we want to prove is, we want to prove that uh, S1 times A and S2 times A, they're far from each other. So even when you scale on the modulus, they don't collide. So we divide the proof into two cases. In the first case, we assume that uh, the first component of the PRG, S1 times B and S2 times B, they're far from each other. So that essentially means S1 times A and S2 times A are also far by default. So that's easy. And in the second case where uh, we assume that S1 times B and S2 times B are close to each other. So that also means S1 times BR and S2 times BR are also close because R is a matrix with plus one minus one domain. But here we know that D is a matrix with large entries. So that essentially means S1 times D and S2 times D are far from each other. So combining uh, these two statements in the blue color, we can actually show that S1 times A and S2 times A are actually far from each other. So even when you scale down the modulus, they don't collide. And this PRG function is injected. And now let's resolve the second issue for why the prior construction is not perfectly correct. The issue is that when P prime of X is not equal to beta, we know that the summation of these output matrices is close to uniform. It has large entries with overwhelming probability, but sometimes the entries of the matrix could be small. In that case, it's hard to distinguish whether P, P of X is equal to beta. And now uh, we wanted uh, we design the final layer M matrices in such a way that this overall summation is always going to have large entries whenever P prime of X is not equal to beta. So here's how we do it. And uh, let me recall, the, so here are the final layer matrices of each branching program. And uh, let's circle the matrices that corresponds to the bits of beta. So that is if the ith bit of beta is one, we circle the green matrix in the ith branching program. If the ith bit of beta is zero, we circle the red matrix in the ith branching program. When the, pre when the program P prime outputs beta, then all the output matrices are going to be the circled ones. And if the program P prime doesn't output beta, it outputs something else. And in that case, at least one of the M output matrices is going to be a non circle matrix. We use this observation to our advantage. Simply speaking, what we do is we take the distribution of these non circle matrices a little bit. We add a matrix D with large entries to each of this to each of these non circle matrix. So that's a new distribution from which we sample these non circle matrices. And now when we sum up uh, with the output matrices, some of the output matrices obtained by evaluating the branching program, what we actually get is an expression like this. The summation of outputs of branching program is going to be S times summation of the final layer output matrices of each branching program. And M bar is the new distribution that we're using right now. And when you've uh, separated it into two parts, you actually get the summation of uh, M output from the original distribution plus C times D. Here D is our uh, large matrix that we're using. And C is the number of places where the program's output differs from beta. So if the program's output differs from beta, in that case, this overall summation is going to have a large entries because of this D factor. Since D has large entries and the summation will have large entries whenever P prime of X is not equal to beta and the obfuscated program 
the evaluation algorithm always outputs the right answer. And so finally, let me finally conclude the talk. In that talk, we described the importance of perfect correctness in case of lock up obfuscation. We identified two sources of correctness errors and we solved both issues. We first constructed inject TPI just from learning with rounding assumption and learning parity with noise assumption. And we also gave an alternate encoding for the final layer matrices of the branching program. So that solves both the correctness issues and our scheme is finally perfectly correct. And thank you for attending my talk. And here's the print version of the paper.